Welcome back to the Dynamic Hour with Harley Schlanger on every Wednesday, hour number one, or his compatriots at the LaRouche Foundation. The websites are LaRouchePAC.com and LaRouchePUB.com for the Executive Intelligence Review. We've got some amazing stories, of course. This is the day after the unbirthday of Obamacare, which is uh, where I've changed uh, the name of the current usurper-in-chief in the White House, the abomination that does shall desolate. I now call him President Un. Unreasonable, unnegotiating, uh, uh, un, unflattered, uh, I mean, in every way possible, this is President Un. Uh, the, the Obamacare is a total mess. It's destroying the economy. The, uh, the, we have two parties, we, the Democrats being the evil party and the Republicans without policy being the stupid party. Uh, we need to start having a move forward like the Tea Parties want, which is basically to move back to a real economy that's based on capitalism, not corporatism, which controls governments as a proxy for a global elite that don't care about austerity fascism and crushing millions of people and dying from austerity fascism. We have to have move toward real policy that builds a real economy, not a funny money economy based on pumping out money printed out of thin air. It's insanity, and uh, uh, Obama literally should have a hard hat on when he already shows up in public with a map of America and a wrecking ball. <laughs> well, you know, I think that the, what we're learning is that when the government goes from dysfunction to complete non-function, uh, there's a problem. And, right. you know, you have people who are cheering the shutdown of government who just don't understand. Part of the shutdown is the disintegration of our armed forces. Right. And this is a very significant problem. Things like food inspection is stopping. Yeah, and not uh, only that, international inspections uh, at ports of entry, 68% of our CDC is shut down at the time when we're very likely to have an airborne plague. Food inspection would prevent food poisoning, toxic foods getting into the country, and foods that will kill people. Yeah, none of these things are being properly managed. It's just insanity, isn't it? No, and, and the idea that you cheer the destruction of the government uh, shows how silly people are who are being hijacked by Dick Army and people like that from the original intent of the Tea Party. You know, the Tea Party actually came into existence around two issues. One was Obamacare, the, the recognition that Obamacare was a disaster, and the second was the bailout and the need to stop Wall Street from getting bailed out by the Federal Reserve and by the U.S. government. Now, the way it got hijacked is that the line came, went out that Obamacare is socialized medicine. It's the government taking over medicine. And it's just not true. It's the insurance no. companies dictating the policies uh, for them to make more money at the expense of the health care system, including the destruction of, the, of doctors, the destruction of hospitals, uh, and the growing profit for insurance companies. As far as the bailouts, they're continuing. And so, right. so in other words, we, we have we literally, people have to understand this. Over the past century, there's been a degradation of real capitalism, which means if somebody has a great idea in their garage, just like in the Founding Fathers, you could start with capital that the, the Founding Fathers set up. You could grow that business and become a successful business, whether it's making buggy whips or whatever. Nowadays, we don't have capitalism. We have corporatism that controls our government through lobby groups, and the corporatism is transnational. So we have transnational corporations that literally run the governments of Earth. This is no longer sovereign states anymore. There's a stretch skins over the titanic uh, monstrosity uh, of globalist corporate government. Well, and what you used to have, what, what you were describing from the Founding Fathers, was written in a report by Alexander Hamilton, <coughs> excuse me, who was our nation's first Treasury Secretary. And Hamilton drafted a proposal uh, that became the law because George Washington supported it, called the Report on, Public Manuf or Report on Manufacturers. And what he argued in that is that the nation would be best served by having credit available to those people who will use artificial labor, that is, move away from muscle power to other forms of production. And, of course, at the time, this included the development of ironworks, uh, textile industry, and the beginning of what later became the machine tool sector. Right. Hamilton understood that productive value is when you add 
more to a product through the labor in it than you do to just making money by selling it cheap. And so his argument was that the Jeffersonian ideal of, of the uh, America as a rural economy or the British idea of America as a colony of the British Empire had to be countered with something positive, which is how do we create value out of something of less value? That's what manufacturing is. And also, by the way, manufacturing obviously improves agriculture. So Hamilton's model worked. And we went from having a huge budget deficit, you might say, with the American Revolution. We owed the war debt, but we paid it off. And we paid it off by having more product than we consumed. That's what productivity is, when you produce more than you consume. You have a surplus. Now, today, we're not producing anything except phony profits, paper profits, based on speculation. And pretty soon, we're going to have food shortages in this country because of that. Yeah, that's going to actually, what we have right now is 20% of our food is imported. There's very likely to be, if this continues to the October 17th, and I want to get your opinion on this, I think we're heading toward the factors that will cause a bond run and a massive devaluation of the dollar, and hyperinflation is going to go crazy. And we're that's what I think seeing, is next. We're already yeah. seeing a drop in the value of the dollar in international markets. But right. you know, they're, they're sort of hedging their bets because if the dollar goes, the world financial system crashes. Right. right. Yeah. If we, have, if we have a hiccup, uh, if we have a hiccup, China has a cardiac arrest. Europe dies. The third world just starves to death. That's what happens. Well, we've already we've already seen this when Bernanke started saying he was going to taper, that is, have the Fed stop buying as much in, in bonds and government bonds and uh, mortgage-backed securities. It led to a, a huge collapse of the stock market in India, collapse of the currency in Brazil. Because we have an integrated world economy, which as a whole is going down. There are some exceptions. Now, China's having some problems, but, but they're not collapsing as fast as we are. The Russian economy is relatively stable. Brazil has some good and bad to it. But Europe is, is in a negative growth spiral downward. And we're in that also. I mean, people who argue that we don't have inflation and that we have an economic recovery is Obama. Obama says, if you shut down the government, it will harm our recovery. Why don't the Republicans say, you liar, there's no recovery. You're faking it. And people right. are suffering because of your policies and because of our boneheadedness of playing into your games. Well, the problem is that Obama uh, is such a narcissist. He can't face reality because uh, it all comes back on his ego and his personal perception of what he thinks he is, like a messianic figure. When the economic realities are that uh, there hasn't been any recovery since 2008, that the mortgage situation is getting worse, that the only 90% of the new jobs created were all part time, that the employers are basically saying we can't afford we can't afford uh, health insurance, so we're, we can't afford the penalties. Uh, I spoke to a gentleman just the other day who said he's going to fire he's basically firing his hundred employees in three restaurants back east, and he's going to sell them. Uh, this is over and over again. What's happening is Obamacare and everything that this government has touched has turned literally to human fecal matter. He has the anti Midas touch. Well, and, and what we're seeing is just the very beginning with Obamacare. But I think what people have to realize is that Obama wanted this shutdown. He oh, yeah, they, because they he get more believes, power. Well, you know, he believes it will be blamed on the Republicans. And he's already accumulating a huge uh, war chest for the 2014 elections, and he's, he's basically convinced Reid and Pelosi to keep the Democrats with him because the Republicans will be blamed and the Democrats will win back the House. That's what Obama thinks. Yeah. Wow. I think that he's a delusional. I think that in the polls that I've seen, that although the Republicans are blamed somewhat, he's blamed double. I think well, they're he both is blamed by most people. Yeah, but I think he's got the edge. Especially his flatant behavior. His flagrant behavior is very, very in your face. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And uh, Harley, the uh, the situation is, uh, I think, going to increase in intensity as we approach October 17th. Where do you think this is all going? Because to me, both parties think in their own crazy mind 
that it's actually their advantage to see the shutdown of government, even if it causes death, destruction, demoralizes the military, delays uh, implementation of food safety laws, or even the CDC for prevention of an incoming plague from the Hajj. I mean, all of this, really, I think that, that maybe the Republicans and Democrats of the present think they're going to kind of get an advantage from this. I think they're crazy. Well, I think, look, that's the most important point to make. Uh, when you think that you're going to get an advantage from people suffering, or even worse, from the degradation of the nation, then why should anyone support you? Why not try to figure out what can we do to reverse the collapse? And this is what we're not seeing. You know, some Republicans are saying, well, we're tying the uh, budget continuing resolution to Obamacare. Well, look, they, we lost the Obamacare fight when it got rammed through the House and Senate and ratified by the Supreme Court. However, it, we could have people running now for 2014 making an issue repeal Obamacare. And by 2014, that would be a winning issue. In the meantime, the damage that's going to be done by Obamacare uh, may not be rever- uh, irreversible, but it's going to do a lot of damage. Now, the other point, when you ask what's going to happen, uh, you know, the budget fight in itself is not uh, fatal. But if you combine it with this uh, question of the debt ceiling, it could be fatal because you could have a default of the United States the U.S. bonds are the one secure spot in the world for all investors. If you lose that, you're going to create a situation where in the short term, you could have a default in the U.S., interest rates could skyrocket to borrow to pay for the U.S. programs. And a fight over these two things, the continuing resolution of the budget and the debt ceiling, does not put us on the right course. The right course is we've got to stop the speculative economy. We've got to stop steering money into swindles. And instead, we've got to start creating credit that will start building our nation. And that's the the Republicans and Democrats, if they're serious, they'll challenge Obama, they'll challenge the House and, and Republican, or House and Senate Democratic and Republican leadership, and we'll go with a policy that they make Glass-Steagall the issue this week. Because the most fundamental thing we have to do, you know, when you think about it, they're fighting over a billion here, a billion there, and trillions, tens of trillions have gone to bail out banks <laughs> and their worthless portfolios. That's or they've gone to work, bail out even European economy and, believe it or not, oil states in the Middle East have actually been able to, to launch into this giant bailout. The total debt I've, I've seen now recorded is somewhere around $248 trillion. So when they, when they were arguing billions, it's like arguing dimes when you've got $100 bills on the table. Well, the actual the, the done work that was done uh, as of six months ago, based on the preliminary figures released by the Fed, which may not be totally accurate, but also right. the Congressional Budget Office and also uh, Neil Borofsky, the Inspector General of TARP, was right. between 23 and $33 trillion. Now, that doesn't include all kinds of other guarantees and things of that sort. But yeah, other, fact, other, money, uh, other guarantees that are part of the... But the, the, ongoing but not, debt. the guarantees are not necessarily money put into circulation. What they're right. basically saying is that if you get a run on this, come see us. Now, what what's really behind this now is that they want to stop the bailouts and move to the bail-ins. And this Uh-oh. is really... But what they're that's, saying is that, well, we don't scary. want to build up the, the uh, outlying or the out flow of money from the Fed. We've got to stop that. But we still have to figure out how to cover these bad positions. And so they're talking, there's something like $7 trillion in deposits in banks. And they're basically saying, let's give the banks access to their depositors' money. And that's written into Title II of Dodd-Frank. And so, you know, but here's the other thing. How far does seven trillion go to cover hundreds of trillions? It doesn't. No. So they're going to. Yeah, I, I think it's like giving like two weeks of uh, reprieve for the death sentence of somebody on death row. Yeah, it's so, sort of like that. And what they're going to say is, well, we're going to steal your money, but the problem is that won't solve anything for you. It will give us a short-term bailout. 
Now, this is why people can't sit back and wait and see what's going to happen. Who's going to win? Who are the winners? Who are the losers? We are all the losers unless we change the policy. Right. And, and that's the thing people have to come away from this with, an understanding that we've been given by our form of government, our Republican form of government, an opportunity for the people to be the deciders. And at this point, we saw something interesting over the last three or four weeks, which is that the people spoke on Syria, and the Obama team took a huge hit. Obama was nearly knocked out of office by this. Some of my friends are saying that what the military did in undermining Obama was a kind of soft coup, that they didn't move in with guns and tanks, but they just deflated Obama. Now, at that point, the Republicans had a couple of things they could have done. One is they could have escalated the investigation into Benghazi to demonstrate that Obama has already violated the uh, constitutional restrictions on what the executive can do to launch offensive military actions. And secondly, they could have gone after the president on his refusal to negotiate so there could actually be a budgetary process. Now, instead of that, they drew a line and they said, we want budget cuts. And I, I've got to tell you, and I know some of your listeners get upset when I say this, but cutting the budget isn't going to turn out, isn't going to produce a surplus. We've seen it in Europe. They're cutting the hell out of budgets. And all it does is shrink the economy further. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually grow a new economy. It's like if you have a garden. You have to tend the soil. You have to put new seeds. You have to have the expensive seeds. Then you have to have the expensive labor to actually have a harvest at the end of your growing season. They don't exactly. understand that's how an economy works. And if you don't have real economy, which means you produce something real, you've just got uh, images in your head, just like the phony mo funny money derivatives economy. And so budget cuts actually do the opposite. It's like saying, well, we're going to plant the seeds, but we're not going to water them, or we won't weed the uh, garden. Uh, then you're not going to have a crop. You're not going to have an economy. You're going to have dead crops, therefore dead people. That, and see, that's where you begin to see the higher purpose when you talk about the evil of Obama. He is yeah. a servant of those people who wish to reduce population worldwide. Right. Now, most Republicans don't want to do that, but their actions are making them ineffective in stopping it. That's why I, I say that we have two parties, the evil party, the Democrats, and the stupid party, the Republicans. And hopefully the, the Tea Party can wise them up enough to force them to deal with these issues like glass steagles number one. Number two, we need to change the structure of the economy so we have a true capitalist economy, not a corporate global economy. Welcome back. And Harley, we have lots of uh, issues to talk about, but... One of the things I like about LaRouche Foundation is that you have solutions. And uh, Linda LaRouche and all the panel members that have been working like yourself for many years have come up with global solutions that actually allow the strengthening of sovereign nations, the increase in movement toward a real credit system rather than the corporate corporatist system right now, and moving away from austerity fascism, which is being forced or tried to be forced on the people in Europe. And they're about to explode against this. I mean, they didn't tell the people in the first place in Europe they were going to try to create a super state, otherwise they never would have got as far as they have. But now that they've pulled in all these nations and bankrupt them, firstly by loaning them like, you know, loan sharks, money like Greece, uh, and then now asking for all the money back. I just talked to a lady the other day that was from uh, Portugal, and the same thing happened to Portugal. They got loaned lots of money in the 90s and the 80s, and uh, of course they're European members, so they get access to all this money, and now all of a sudden they can't pay off their debts, so they're going under. And the austerity fascism means young people, even with a degree, can't get a job. They can't have a home. They can't have a family. This is literally not just having effects on the economy in terms of selling things. It has effects on actual human suffering where people have to put the future on hold. They can't get married, can't have a home, can't buy a car, can't even do anything, even take a vacation. It's just ridiculous. Let me give you a sense of the bigger mission that's beckoning us. Uh, I had the opportunity to spend last weekend with uh, Lyndon LaRouche up in Virginia. Uh, he just celebrated his 91st birthday, and he's still going strong as ever. But what he laid out is, is really interesting. He was talking about 
how Europe escaped the Dark Ages in the middle of the 15th century. And it was largely the work of one <clears throat> brilliant theologian, philosopher, scientist named Nicholas Cusanos, Nicholas of Cusa. And he came up with another, he's, he's a founder, really, of modern science. Uh, Kepler and, and Leibniz cite him as the most important figure for them. But what Cusa said is, look, we can't solve the situation in Europe because of all these stupid oligarchs. We, we've got little empires and big empires, and there's no, they, they, they refuse to allow people of merit to emerge. They crush the population. And so he came up with an idea of going to the unsettled lands to the West. And this was transmitted through a number of people to Toscanelli, the mapmaker, who was very close with Christopher Columbus. And you know, the, the idea of creating a new world, uh, Thomas More called it the utopia. Uh, the whole idea was then picked up by the Massachusetts Bay Colony, where they resisted the colonial imperial policies of the British up to the point that we had a war against them and we won our revolution. And we created a new world, a, a new model of a constitutional republic with an economic policy that would benefit the people rather than private interests. Now, that tradition is still here, but it's, it's under, well, it's, it's been really eliminated from Europe. And they're on the verge through the Bush administration and now the Obama administration of destroying it here in this country. So LaRouche said, let's take up the Cusa project idea of going to the West. You have large populations in China, in Japan, in South Korea, in India. Uh, not a large population in Russia, but a, a, a population with a lot of scientists. They want the American system. They want the kind of approach that we had when our country was on the ascent. And so this is what the idea of Nawapa 21 is, the, the Bering Strait Tunnel, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, the Kra Canal through Thailand. You know, great projects that would integrate the best of the U.S. with the best of these countries. Now, one of my associates was just in Japan, which is going through a complete collapse. And their, prime, their president, Abe, is imitating uh, Bernanke with a quantitative easing policy that's destroying what's left of Japanese industry. So we were hosted by people who were basically Japan, Inc., the 70- to 80-year-old people who were there who rebuilt Japan after World War II and made it the industrial engineering giant that it became. And they said, we want to be in on this with you in the United States. We want to build the Bering Strait Tunnel. We want to rally our population for these projects. Now, I just was invited to speak at a conference of top Chinese people who will be holding it in, uh, Chinese government people will be holding it in Los Angeles at the end of this month to talk about how China can participate with this. Uh, so there's an enormous potential. But that's exactly what Obama is being deployed to to suppress, to wipe right. out. He, he doesn't want to have a natural alliance with Russia or China or uh, the Trans-Siberian Pipeline. It could also reduce our pollution because they have higher quality oil and gas. They won't be polluting. Uh, also, the amount of trade that could occur. Then we have proper intellectual property protection against our movie industry and our intellectual property of our corporations. I mean, we could have a much more... You know, instead of putting trillions of dollars into an advanced military of wars that we can't even start to fight, people need to realize that war is obsolete now. If anybody starts a war and it moves from proxy wars up to the great powers, nothing on earth is going to survive. You know, this is why it's important that we really think back to what John Kennedy was doing at the end of his life. He was a World War II veteran who hated war. He consulted with people like Douglas MacArthur, General Charles de Gaulle, with Eisenhower, and they all reached the conclusion that the United States should not get involved in Vietnam or any proxy wars, especially wars in areas that were once under imperial control. Secondly, Kennedy was moving against the Federal Reserve. This is the June 1963 order. Executive Order 11110 
to establish treasury notes to be outside of the Federal Reserve so that you could actually fund industrial innovation starting with the steel industry. Kennedy was moving in a, in a whole series of, of directions which scared the hell out of the empire and they had him killed. And I, I right. think if what, what you just said about the you can't win a war, this is what Kennedy was saying, that the right. prospect of thermonuclear war means within 30 minutes hundreds of millions, if not billions of people are wiped out. Who yeah, wins I, such a war? No well, one. there's several way, waves of death. The first wave of death is a wave of those who just get turned to atomic dust. The second wave is those who get exposed to massive radiation. The third wave is a wave called the degradation of society. We're not talking about going back to the Stone Age. The Stone Age will be like the Sandals Resort. So most people will literally cannibalize each other, starve to death, or die of disease because of a degraded environment. And Even the lack of power. And the fact, fact is, we, we don't understand that literally it's be like the uh, Tonga explosion of 75,000 years ago where humanity was knocked back in volume of total population to probably uh, in range of 10,000 people. Well, and Kennedy was quoting the statement. I don't remember who first made it. But the living, those who lived through a nuclear war would envy the dead. Exactly, you know, yeah. So I the point the point is the humanity also will not be able to have normal children after that. Uh, the kind of children that will be born will be monstrosities and in genetically inferior, incapable of, of dealing with a vicious world where survival requires high levels of fitness and genetic ability to adapt to extreme environments. And uh, it, develop extreme file behavior, even on, you know, in, in a highly pressurized state of a post-apocalyptic world, is going to take millennia. Mandine doesn't have that. What we're going to see is a massive die-off. If, if there's any remaining population, it'll be tiny pockets. It'll take tens of thousands of years for whatever degraded population manages to scramble back to some form of existence. If they do, it all survive. Well, that's we're not talking about necessarily producing a, a nuclear winter. We're just talking about everything's happening. UV light exposure because you destroy the upper ionosphere and you end up with UV light shock to the Earth. Drops in oxygen concentration because you kill the benthic layer of the oceans. The amount of dust and chemicals and toxic material in the air. I mean, people don't understand. We're talking about uh, war is obsolete. People have to understand that. That's, we that's cannot... why we put out this leaflet that said, destroy Wall Street <clears throat> before it kills you. Right. Because Wall Street's uh, ultimately, the bankers know their ultimate weapons are debt and war. And neither one uh, is consistent with the ongoing existence of humanity. Debt and war. Back in a moment. Welcome back. And Harley, um, again, the number to contact if they want to get a hold of you is 800-922-2907. 800-922-2907. And by the way, every hour of the program, the Nutri Medical Report is open for call-ins at 800-259-5791. 800-259-5791. And uh, Harley, if they call you, they're going to get information on how to get involved with the uh, LaRouche Foundation because you provide real solutions, a vision for refurbished nations, not a corporatist state where nations are no longer just kind of places on a map, but nations that are stronger because they have a real vibrant, productive economy, like America is being stripped to the bone like a, like a Thanksgiving turkey. And uh, there's no need for this. Obama, in his stupid idea of communism, you keep on taking from the producers until the, you know, they say they take from Peter to pay Paul, but eventually you peter out. <laughs> <laughs> no more Peters. And you can't do that. you got to make more Peters. You have to actually have a system where Peters multiply across the horizon with new businesses, new ideas, new technologies, new efficiencies, and collaborate with the Peters in other countries, in China and Russia and elsewhere, where all of a sudden you create new levels of industry that a decade or so before, those jobs weren't even conceived in the imagination. That's what we need to have. Well, that's what innovation is, and innovation comes not from the, the, the myth of someone in a garage, but it actually starts with science. And right. if you don't have an, an orientation of a nation to science, for example, what happens when, when greeny ideology takes over everything? You know, all of a sudden, the most unscientific views become the dominant views of the culture. And that's what we have right now, the idea that that we're facing global warming because of man, which 
you know, a hundred years ago, no scientist would have been such an idiot as to accept something like that. You know, the the uh, the complete lack of an orientation towards science and the replacement of it with this idea of the omnipresent computer technology. Look, computers are marvelous things. They do a lot of good things for you. But computers don't replace human intelligence and creativity. They're a product of that. Now, what we have is fewer and fewer people who are creative. And we're not going to survive if we continue this way. Creativity involves three aspects. The first thing is perspective. You've got to look at the world differently. The second aspect is you have to ask different questions. And in fact, they don't teach this in school to ask better questions. And the third is to find solutions that have never been found before, which means to literally see beyond the end of your range of your visual senses and start putting together new paradigms that will solve problems that didn't exist before. Um, just like Fukushima Daiichi, or the economy, or production of energy from the vacuum, which Dr. Professor McKenney talks about from the plasma universe, which he's put forward in his books. Um, there, it really, you know, the problems of our 21st century, a century or two from now, if mankind grasps the true vision, they will laugh at us, wondering why we thought this was a problem. And at the well, same time, why did we pollute our Earth and even promulgate war, which is obsolete? Yeah, well, you know, the the thing that comes up here is the obvious point, which is that throughout history there have been people who have been willing to sacrifice the greater good for the purpose of their own power. Right. And, you know, we refer to this as, as uh, evil empires or uh, satanic forces, but in fact it's a, it's a real factor in the universe. It, it really does exist. And when you have yeah. something like this, the only way you can deal with it is you, you've got to you've got to fight it. Right. You've got to present an alternative to it. You you can't simply say, uh, well, well uh, we can we can coexist yeah, with it. Yeah, you're, in problem. other words, you're, you're 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 kind of bashing the what I call the stupid party, the Republicans. As I say, I'm coming up with a ten point plan. I'll probably have it by Friday this week. Later, it's what an alternative to Obamacare is. It's not going to come in in one step. We have to win the Senate and the Congress. But the congressmen, if there's any listening or their aides right now, they need to know you've got to come up with solutions. You just can't be Dr. No and say no to anything that the other party does that's evil, like the current Democrats and Obamacare. You have to come up with solutions that are going to give a credit economy, allow people, the nation to stay solvent and not default on its debts. You have to get away from the Fed Reserve System, get away from the Glass-Steagall uh, issues where they allow you know, the funny money to literally suck dry the real economy, and you have to get rid of all kinds of things that are literally enslaving us to corporatism. We don't have capitalism. We have a corporatist global estate that manages and controls all of our politicians, all of our little corporations, and have wiped out. True capitalism is a historical fact is gone. Well, and, and the obvious point here when you, you start looking at this is that it's happened while people have been watching it. It's not as though people didn't know this was going on. Maybe they don't know the details. I mean, I have access to political intelligence, uh, economists. Yeah, yeah, I, have, yeah. I have a lot that gives me an advantage. Right. But most but, people but. can see that the reports of uh, the so-called recovery are just a lie. They can see that. Yeah. It, so you know, it's like it's like somebody in the ICU that recovers. They're in cardiogenic shock, and they've got a heart-lung bypass machine on, and they come out of coma for two seconds and blink their eyes, and they call it a recovery when the patient's dying. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Well, and you see, the point is, the Republicans know this, and what the Republicans should be saying is, Mr. President, you're lying to the American people about a recovery. We're going to get this budget thing out of the way. We're going to get the debt ceiling out of the way. And now we're going to go with a real recovery, starting with Glass-Steagall. Because the one thing Obama doesn't want, the thing he's most scared of, is Glass-Steagall. And this is why it's interesting. The Democrats are a lot of Democrats are supporting Glass Steagall. These are the same Democrats who worked with the Republicans to prevent the war in Syria. And so what we've got to say is take that bipartisanship that's against NSA spying and against drones and against IRS uh, subversion and, and against war. Link up now on the one thing Obama's most frightened of, Glass Steagall. 
Well, and that's here's, how we're going to deal with the economy. Here's what I think Obama and many parties, uh, parts of the Republican Party and the globalist bankers behind him want. They want government shutdown. They want October 17th for the debt ceiling to strike. They want a bond run. They want a bond run. They want devaluation of the currency. They want millions in soup lines without adequate food left because the crops are failing around America and around the world. They want this because it will allow them the introduction of a new financial Ponzi scheme, a biometric world system tied to drones, tied to Obamacare, which I call as a Trojan horse, because the Trojan horse is it's only incidentally involving health care. Most of it is control where they literally can go into your bank accounts and withdraw money because they've doubled or tripled the premiums with higher deductibles into orbit. And people are saying, well, 25% of the population are saying, I'm not going to buy insurance anymore. I'm just going to pay the penalties. Duh. Do you think hospitals are going to be able to stay in business like that? Do you think the trauma centers, the emergency departments, the imaging centers, which I think are great, are going to exist? Now, I'm against toxic polypharmacy for chronic conditions. But we could re-engineer a healthcare system cost a quarter what we have that would cover everyone and make sure nobody's left out. And yet, at the same time, gives autonomy to the doctor, privacy to the patient, and somebody flying into, you know, to uh, airports in Germany, in Frankfurt, would not have some Frankfurt officer saying, "I'm sorry, these prescriptions in your bag you're not allowed to have because they're not in your database for your medical records." That's the kind of stuff where a squad car outside your home can know what your wife is taking or her health conditions, but you can't ask her doctor. This is the kind of foolishness because of what they want, and this is why Obama and these other yahoos, they're not just politicking this. They want the Trojan horse of the Obamacare disaster, which is going to be, you know, destroy the economy, but they want a rule by what I call the catastrophism so that they can create the new Ponzi scheme, which is literally, as it says in the Bible, a biometric world currency system such as no one have the mark who shall buy or sell. We're talking about the mark of the beast. We're steps away from this when we see drones over cities now all over the place, when we see a biometric system coming in by it's supposedly 2009 bumped up to May of next year, which is 2014. All of this is designed, and so it's not, it's not just mistakes or, oops, we couldn't negotiate. They have no intention of negotiating. They want this. And the only way it's going to change is if people get involved. And uh, give me a call, 800-922-2907, and get involved with us. Let's get Glass-Steagall in. That's the way to defeat Obama. Yeah, once you get Glass-Steagall, this is, the, as they say, the edge of the wedge. It'll be the end. It'll be like the nine-inch spikes through the, through the vampire of Obama. Count obama <laughs> No, no, you're... You don't drive the spike through my chest by putting glass steagall, I'll die. That's what we need. <laughs> That's what we need. Okay, talk to you next time. Take, take care.